Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. My name is Ricky Cassidy. I'm taking over for Dennis Izaki, who started this show a long time ago. I do have some news about Dennis. Uh, he's one of my best friends, uh, probably my worst enemy, because he asked me to take over uh, to do the show. And for that, I'm very grateful. He actually um, has given me a possibility of learning something and, and maybe even growing more mature. I mentioned him up front, uh, and then I'm going to segue into my guest, who's uh, an old, old friend uh, with a fine mind, um, who I've known in my capacity as doing market research. And uh, every so often, she would call up, and we'd talk about real estate. And um, she's a reporter, and it was fun for me to talk about it with her because she had a 360 degree view. She was interested in everything. On top of that, she's pretty intelligent. She did it for PBN for a long time. That's Janice Magnan, and I'm gonna welcome her to the show and start by saying, tell me something about yourself. Um, well, as you mentioned, I used to write about real estate full time but I no longer do that. I still do in some capacity as a freelance writer. Um, so we still talk about, about stuff, right? Yeah, I'm, yes. uh, yeah, I've been in, in uh, Hawaii for like 22 years, but originally from New York. So we, we have some, that. we have, we have some connections too. Yeah. And then the serious thing, um, is, I mean, it's great fun being interviewed. It's always fun to ask questions um, for you. And it, it's even more fun for me to keep on talking for me, uh, even though many have said to me, I talk too much. Um, but in our context, uh, it, it was a data dump uh, of all sorts of things. I do a report, some of which would tell a trend Others were who's going to develop what, where, when, how. Uh, and because of your involvement in that, you had two things. You, you, you had, a, again, a 360 view of all sorts of different facets. So, you know, you, the, it was fun to be questioned because of all the different aspects. And then you'd pull out examples uh, and um, they would be current one. And um, the thing I did remember um, being impressed by was your facility of gathering information on the web. You went deep into the internet and you're able to really track ownership of things. Um, that, that was your skill. Um, and for that, I give you full credit. How did you kind of develop that? You weren't a market researcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, just out of necessity, out of having to find information and not always relying on people to tell me what the information was, um, because uh, data doesn't lie usually, and and uh, you know things, public records are very useful. Uh, I think a lot of journalists don't take enough advantage of all the public records that are out there that can tell you tell you things that maybe people don't necessarily want you to know or want you to know yet. And, you know, like you said about ownership, about projects, um, you know, being developed and whatnot. So it was just, I guess, uh, persistence over the years of digging wherever I could find something and, and then bookmarking it and going back to it over and over again. So. Segwaying from that, uh, for me, uh, starting out at Gentry and doing uh, market research and collecting data and then representing it, knowledge was power. Uh, and the power was making people think. Uh, it ultimately, in my profession, led me to be able to answer questions. I used data to answer questions. Um, and that was helpful. Um, yours is something similar, only you, you kind of, as a journalist, anticipate the, the you know, their questions, the five 
questions that you have to answer in, in an article, the who, what, when, wow, well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right. And then uh, knowing something gives you context in interviewing uh, because you can go backwards in times and, and then maybe add on something thing. So um, that's admiral. Did anybody treat you like you were all powerful? <laughs> I mean, only you. <laughs> only me. Well, you were. I mean, I'm kidding. actually, I'm kidding. No, no, but it's not a bad answer. Uh, I mean, <laughs> but you, you were powerful to me because you knew stuff that I didn't. Uh, in yeah. terms of other people, did that ever cross your mind, or, or? Um, no, no, I never made that assumption. Oh, cool. Because there's always somebody who knows more. Who knows more than me or, you know, I, I never assumed that my, I always assumed my readers would know more than I did about certain things, right? Right. Yeah. And so did they talk yeah. to you about that? Did you get a dialogue going at all? Um, did they say this? Did they say that? Sometimes people would, uh, sometimes people would reach out after something was published to comment on you know what what the story was or to say yeah but you should really look at this thing or that thing or you know um to let me know there were other things going on because you know I, I I was not privy to conversations behind the scenes and I was not privy to a lot of things so what you can glean from public records is one thing but Sometimes something else is going on, as you well know, right? It's all context. Uh, context yeah. is why um, why news is important. There's a great quote from Alan Kay, who was one of the original computer scientists in 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 Bay Area, and he said, "My paraphrase: uh, context." is worth 50 points of IQ. And what he meant was that when you form a team to solve a problem like build a computer, uh, yeah. you don't always need the smartest guy or they don't always have to be the smartest. But if somebody can give you a frame, that's that's worth 50 points of IQ, which meant that after I read that, I said, well, I'm at 51. <laughs> so the press has a great utility um, in public. Mm -hmm. uh, it's protected by the First Amendment. You uh, uh, you can protect your sources. You never protected me, unfortunately. That's a joke for those of us that <laughs> don't know how I roll. But um, it, it, it stands out singularly. Well, amongst all, all other things, as a real public benefit. Because if you can pr protect your source, you can get something valuable. Um, today with a blog um, that we see, um, it, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm jumping some, somewhere, but I just, I don't, I'm, you and I talked before about comparing news and how we get our information, and, and a lot of it is blogs mm -hmm. uh, rather than paid um, journalists. And yeah. you get what you pay for. Yeah. How do you respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> do you pay well, for I mean, hmm. well, I, um, you know, I went to school to for journalism. I trained as a journalist. I worked for... Um, Associated Press for a number of years and came out here with them. And um, so then you have people who have a blog and call themselves a journalist. So that's like, you know, I just because I have a box of Band-Aids doesn't make me a doctor, right? So <laughs> anyway... <laughs> well, anyway, so I mean, that's the value in having in having somebody who's who's a journalist who knows what they're doing, who has experience, and who is working with other journalists and editors, you know. To and there's and and it goes beyond knowing how to write or knowing how to find things on the internet. There's judgment that 
is, you know, you, you don't necessarily have just from starting a blog. So yeah, that's my, <laughs> that's my two cents, but I mean, there is value. There are a lot of bloggers that I do read. There's a lot of people who write newsletters. There is value to what they have to say. So it's not everybody, but, um, you know, there is, it, it's, there's a lot more noise out there right now than there was, you know, 20 years ago, even. So. The thing about um, having a team around you, an editor, a publisher, and a um constitutional right lawyer um is that yeah it gets vetted um very well um some of the problems i've always had with professional journalism is the standard that you have to get two stories sources and it's not that that um you have to get two sources per se it's just some subjects are so I mean, our, our, our charge and and the re response, say, of me talking about somebody else, if I do it wrong, then they're going to get mad at me. And so I'm not going to be frank and honest. That's that's the common one. The other one that used to bug me was that uh, I wanted um, I, I wanted my point to be taken first and foremost and the heck with everybody else's. But that's human nature. Um, yeah. And, and so I would read to hear the opposite side. TV news for me has just gotten horrible because it's it's shouting and it's it's selling um, commercials. Um, and then I'll, I'll cave in a little and say what uh, uh, validate what you said about bloggers. Um, there's a couple that really have integrity. They're usually specialized and they follow things through. So, um, so a lot me, of. A lot of them are former journalists or former, you know, working journalists. So, so it's grained into it, ground into them. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, and it's got to be one of the more fun professions, uh, kind of like taxi driving. <laughs> As a taxi driver, but when you get up in the morning, uh, again, you don't know where you're going to go you know where you're going to start perhaps yeah yeah i mean yeah it depends on what you do and, and where you do it um you know for a lot of reporters they're out in the field they they show up to the office and then get sent somewhere and maybe don't come back you know for hours and hours and are out running around interviewing people or um you know, when I worked for AP, we had, there were natural disasters that, um, you know, I got sent to a tornado that hit and it was in the South and it hit on, uh, on a Sunday and took out half of a church and half the people in it. And, you know, I was kind of the junior person on the scene. There were a lot of people, you know, um, several people, you know, my colleagues, but there were national news from all over. And that's, so that's something that not everybody gets to do, right? So, and it's not, not always, you know, it's not always good news. There's a lot of, a lot of tragedy that happens, you know, so, you know, covering business, we didn't, we didn't really have as much tragedy covering business. <laughs> yeah, that segues into the next one, which would be, um... Okay, you, you deal with offense and your uh, disasters, but when you deal with business events, uh, I'm, there's always disasters, but business events, to my mind, would give uh, you an idea of trends. There, there, there'd be incretive, uh, incremental, or stories repeated with incremental changes or evolutions. Um, right. And and what you had, you talked to yourself about that, or when you were reporting, did you kind of bring that out? in when you were interviewing people, yeah, I I was always looking for trends because trends are good stories, and they um, it's a good way of like kind of piecing every uh, 
some maybe disparate stories that maybe didn't look like they were related, but then they all have a theme um, of growth or I don't, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm blanking out on, on thinking of a good trend to give you an example of, but no, we, I'm we ask you, about that. you know, mm. okay. Because in, in, in the sense, the other thing uh, to segue from is, is real estate. It's multidisciplinary. And, um, you know, uh, the hip bone is connected to the neck bone kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and um, uh, that's why it was fun to talk to you to go down all the different uh, avenues. The, that thing um, was fun. And, and then trends would, would develop out of it. So over your time here, you've seen a number of trends. The big one today is affordable housing. Uh, the big one before that was probably, I mean, way back in, in the 60s, it, it actually was land reform when, when they got mm -hmm. rid of the leasehold system. Um, right. But, uh, I mean, what do you look for today or what? Um, well, I write primarily about residential real estate now. So I'm always looking for trends because I'm trying to give readers um, kind of an more of an overview, less less of specific about one particular um, person or place or, you know, ask, but try to try to pick off different aspects of, because like you said, real estate, there's so much that it touches. And especially in Hawaii, it's, it's kind of, it's a big part of our economy here. Um, you know, it's very expensive, their land ownership, there's still some large landowners in the state that control some of the, you know, some of the properties, um, but not as much as you touched upon land, land reform. We don't have the same kind of leasehold environment that we had. Um, it's much smaller now, right? And, um, but, you know, real estate is a huge, it's the biggest investment. A, a home is the biggest investment most people will make in their lifetime. So it's their, and especially in Hawaii, I think a lot of people, their their home, because our values have gone up so much, it's like 40% since pre-pandemic. So on Oahu, overall, like not different na neighborhoods are different, right? But, you know, a lot of people look at their house as their piggy bank and how they're going to retire or send a kid to college, you know, so it's it's uh it's an important it's an important topic for almost everybody even if they're not looking to buy or sell a home they're living somewhere right majority of people are living somewhere and and majority of people are paying a lot of money to live live in that place so yeah i mean interest rates have been the big story in the last year that we went from an environment of two you know, two and a quarter percent. Now it's pushing seven. So that cuts buying power. A lot of people just kind of dropped out of the market because, you know, maybe they maybe they have the down payment, maybe they have the monthly income, but their monthly payment just went up considerably. So. Oh, thank you for sore subjects. Um, yeah. So let me turn it around and and say it's it's not just a personal issue and it's widely personal and land yeah. in more than any any other place I can think of uh, Hawaiian land is a big deal. Um, yeah. You got a you mentioned that there was an award uh, given uh, to the real estate reporting that you do in Hawaii, um, and my re response to that was just how personal it is, but some of the trends, some of my feelings are that uh, it's not just personal, but you aggregate everybody, be it, it the mortgage situation or the buying situation or the rental situation. And, and in my lifetime, I've seen the regulation on housing grow by dint of it being more and more important to more and more people and being kind of 
one of their major issues or or factors in voting for people. And, mm -hmm. and um, it's resulted in, um, to my mind, uh, there's a lot of confusion out there about an affordable housing. And part of that is because politicians have said, vote for me because I'm for affordable housing. But the definition of affordable is 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 a made up one, and everybody gets frustrated because um, I say, you know, I, Representative Ricky, uh, am at a groundbreaking for affordable housing, and in order uh, and the project um, had to bring in affordable prices that everybody don't consider affordable. Um, there's no kind of uh, way of, of explaining this easily and, and yeah. that's it it's has complicated to be yeah very complicated because because the definition of affordable housing according to government right is is housing that's regulated according to the the financing of how it's built right with some public money from in Hawaii, it's the rental housing revolving trust. And it's also low income housing tax credits that investors get involved with. And then the developer is has all kinds of regulations on them. And then they're, they're the amount of money that they can charge for rent is spelled out under those rules as well, right? Right. No. And no. and it's not. It, you know, I look at the rents, and you know, uh, there's a project that I was talking to my mother about. Maybe maybe she should go there, and she's actually paying less for a private apartment. Uh, and in, in an apartment building than she would in this, you know, quote unquote, affordable housing project for seniors. So, you know, your definition of affordable and mine may not be the same. So. It has to be that way. And, and it's also the landlord, I, I would think in your mother's case, but. Yeah. I was smiling a second ago uh, thinking to myself, boy, affordable housing really is a lousy story. Um, you, you, you just regurgitate the facts, but the, um, and, and you know the eyeballs will follow, but it it doesn't have context. And, and it, so you see, you would know this best in Kailua, you see Makani Maeva trying to get uh, to do some affordable housing infill and the six or 10 or 20 neighbors around her are rallying um, the neighborhood totally against it. And she um, she tried very hard, but th th she just couldn't convince them. So this is an affordable housing that turned into a drama. And I'm seeing more and more of that. Um, and rightfully so. Yeah. I would Everybody wants affordable housing. They just don't want it next door to their house, right? Yeah. But I think I think there's also the other misnomer about affordable housing is that I think people equate affordable housing with public housing, and affordable housing is is something it's for people who are working. Like there's a stack of paper they have to fill out to qualify, and chief among it is a job with a paycheck, right? So so it's, you know, it's people who have jobs who are, but maybe they just don't have very high paying jobs. So it's the people who work at, you know, restaurants or even, even you know, they like to say cops and teachers, right? So. Uh, and then it rolls through the economy when, um, restaurants can't can't get laborers, and yeah. uh, uh, and it downsizes things. Um, one of the things that uh, is new in my life is that all my working life, at least in Hawaii, uh, I have depended on 
housing and development and production, you know, for my paycheck. And as I get to the end of it, uh, hopefully not right now uh, in this moment, uh, I start to think, well, what's sustainable and what's balanced? And how do you have a um, locals versus visitors um, sustainable and and a productive and and sensitive so, society, equitable yeah. all that stuff. Um, and I just don't know how to start that conversation. Do you have any ideas? It's hard because it, it, there's so many different factors into play. You know just the regulation and the the pace of how fast or slow things get done here and the money money is at the root of it all right and the carrying you know developers say i have to charge more the longer it takes i have to charge more because of the carrying costs because they're paying interest to the lender on land that they can't get permits for. So, you know, I don't have the answers. It needs profit and profit doesn't necessarily mean a, a great word. Uh, if you wanna stop a project, you throw sand in it and slow it down and all that happens. And yeah, basically they will fold up and go away. Um, some of it is you just don't want change, but you're not building for the future. Um, and uh, and your kids and yeah, not a lot, you know. I don't know. I hate to say, I'll, I will, at the risk of not sounding like one known Johnny, I'll end the show here because I'm about mm -hmm. to say what's obvious, which is, you know, um, God balance sustainability and 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 profit. So on that note, yeah. we've hit thirty minutes. How about that? All right. <laughs> You get a round of applause uh, <laughs> for sticking with us, and, and your smile is worth everything, and so is your friendship. So thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.